Welcome to the Ray Harryhausen podcast, the show dedicated to the life, career and films of a special effects titan. Join us as we host in-depth discussions about the work, influences and legacies of this uniquely talented filmmaker. Brought to you by the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation, we will be delving into Ray's archive to bring a unique insight into his work, including exclusive audio from the man himself. We will be joined by special guests for retrospectives, exclusive announcements and competitions, so this podcast is a must-listen for all fans of the world of Ray Harryhausen, animation and classic filmmaking. Hello and welcome to episode 18 of the Ray Harryhausen podcast, episode 18 and also part 2 of our musical retrospective from the films of Ray Harryhausen. I'm joined today once more by trustee John Walsh. Hello John. Hello Connor. And we have a very special episode as I said because we're going to be exploring the music of Bernard Herrmann and his collaborations with Ray Harryhausen. Now in our last episode we were discussing some of the composers who'd contributed to Ray's earliest projects and perhaps some of whom had been perhaps lost in the mists of time or slightly obscure in the year 2018. But the man we'll be talking about today needs practically no introduction at all. He's one of the most famous film composers of all time and an absolute legend of soundtracks and a huge personality of the 20th century, Bernard Herrmann. And of course, he worked on four films with Ray Harryhausen, four of Ray's most beloved films. That's right. So, and nearly five, because he nearly worked on First Men in the Moon. Now, if I kick off, Connor, by asking you, because you're you're a relatively young man, <laughs> when you first got to sort of know about films and film music and so on, when were you sort of first aware of Bernard Herrmann? Was it working with the foundation or did you know about some of the famous themes he'd done for Hitchcock, like Psycho and so on? I think because Bernard Herrmann's work is so diverse, it was a case of, of joining the dots, really, because I think everybody knows uh, at least one or two of... Bernard Herrmann's themes and there's of course Psycho and all of those fabulous Hitchcock collaborations and it's, I'd seen all of Ray's films so I knew that the scores were brilliant but it was a case of when I started with the foundation joining the dots backwards and realising that the same composer was responsible for so many different soundtracks and so many wonderful and iconic pieces of music and I think a lot of younger people are probably in my shoes as well, well, they recognise the music, but don't necessarily realise that it's the same man who's responsible for all these all these different soundtracks and all of these uh, eclectic contributions to the musical landscape. But the interesting thing about Bernard Herrmann is that, like the Beatles or the Stones or you know other famous um, musicians, there is a Bernard Herrmann sound. So when we think about his collaborations with Hitchcock and Wells, Orson Wells. There is a certain undercurrent with the brass being used almost as a percussive, if we think of North by Northwest. If we think of strings as a percussive in, in Psycho as well, um, part of the inspiration for Jaws came from the Psycho soundtrack. So to have a look and a sound sometimes can pigeonhole you. So towards the end of his career, he was finding it very hard to get work. And yet his final film score in 1976, Taxi Driver, was very against type. It was it was much more of an experimental jazz style, and of course, um, Taxi Driver is now amongst um, considered one one of the best soundtracks, of course, of all time. So it shows that when filmmakers like Martin Scorsese are prepared to experiment, you can get more from Bernard Herrmann than the sort of um, the the rumbustious sort of heavy orchestral score. But for so many films of the era, his his score suited so well. Um, so I think he, he was somebody who, who could do light and shade. And as, as we speak later on to the Bernard Herrmann Society on our podcast, which was, which was terrific, um, they explain as well about the light and dark, you know, and the shade of his work. And, and some surprising conclusions there from, from Gunther, from the uh, Bernard Herrmann Society. But should we kick off, Connor, with um, some selected tracks? You, you, you've made a selection. What, what's your first one? Well, the first track that I've chosen is probably one of the most iconic sequences from any of Ray's films, and it comes from his first collaboration with Bernard Herrmann. The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad in 1958 featured Ray's first skeleton battle, where Kerwin Matthews Sinbad 
has a sword fight with a living skeleton and the music contributes greatly to this sequence and it's one of Bernard Herrmann's I guess it shows you just how much thought and how much input that the composer put into all of his films and his collaborations with Ray. Uh, he really threw himself in and, and created motifs for each of Ray's creatures which is why the Seventh Voyage soundtrack is so iconic to this day. Now for this scene in the film uh, famously the fight choreographer Enzo Musumeke Greco trained with Sinbad actor Kerwin Matthews for days on end uh, to practice the fight's choreography and rehearsed every move in the sequence meticulously. During the actual filming for the animation, Enzo would stand off screen clapping the beats to the fight off camera to keep Matthews on track. Um, this inspired Bernard Herrmann to compose the famous Castanet Concerto for the sequence's soundtrack and it's a very evocative piece with the xylophones, the castanets, the horns in the background. Uh, it adds to this feeling of a, a, almost like a dance sequence and it raises an already iconic piece of animation into an, an absolutely legendary scene and this music is the, the perfect soundtrack to what became one of Ray's signature sequences. <laughs> great hearing that again and that's of course a stereo recording all of Bernard Herrmann's recordings were done as as stereo sometimes between four to five microphones placed for left and right and th there's varying debates about the microphone setups but it is a true stereo recording and it still exists and it's available on the Entrada records label um, for some of the other um, Bernard Herrmann Harryhausen collaborations they only exist in in mono form and that's a bit of a shame audiences wouldn't have heard them in stereo in most theaters because when the films get mixed down during a film mix a, a mono version is made so it's mixed with the dialogue the effects and so on and then it gets mixed down to a final audio stem for optical so it means that some of race films only exist in mono form and i think a good example of that connor is next up which is the overture for the three worlds of gulliver you know, this is a, a wonderful piece of music in itself. You'll be able to hear the difference uh, with the, the mono sound that John was describing. The, the music itself is, is wonderful. It really puts a spring in your step. It fits the film fantastically. If you, if, you need, if you need motivation, this is a great song to play when you get up early in the morning. It, it really puts a spring in your step. Now, for Three Worlds of Gulliver, I find it very interesting. Again, it's testament to Bernard Herrmann's character and the investment which he put into his music. When he became aware of the project, obviously, um, Gulliver's Travels is a, a legendary 18th century novel by Jonathan Swift, and Herman used this as a as an opportunity to indulge his passion for music from the 18th century, specifically from English composers, some of whom, at, even in the, the mid-1950s, were considered uh, a little obscure. So, for this film's release, Bernard Herman thought he would play 
tribute to some of the, the whimsical and um, buoyant music, almost like a maritime feel which is appropriate for the film. So let's listen to the overture from The Three Worlds of Gulliver. <laughs> That's great, so that's 1960. And it still sounds pretty clear, and that's available on Cloud9 Records, although I'm not sure if it's still available. It may be deleted. Um, it's interesting, some of these scores have been re-recorded as well by, by fans and collaborators of Bernard Herrmann using the original sheet music and giving a, a full stereo effect. But I, I prefer, as a bit of a purist, even if it's in mono, I prefer to hear the original recordings um, orchestrated and conducted by uh, Bernard Herrmann himself. Now, as we get to the middle phase, Mysterious Island is up next. And that's quite a different look and feel, if you like, for music, because whereas Seven Voyage and Three Worlds were very thematic, and you can you can tell instantly that um, one's an Arabian adventure and one's a much sort of lighter lyrical piece, Mysterious Island could well have been a Hitchcock. And Mysterious Island was 1961, and from its opening sequence and the, the track you're about to hear, it's, it's darker, I think. For a family slash children's film adventure, it's much darker. Let's take a listen. <laughs> What do you think, Connor? That's a very different look and feel and vibe from Seventh Voyage and Three Worlds of Gulliver. Yes, very ominous sounding, I think. Um, very dramatic, uh, puts you in the, the, the right frame of mind for the film's opening scenes, which obviously lead with the, the escape and the hot air balloon sequence in, in the storm. But yeah, I think, again, 
it fits perfectly. It sounds quite different from the uh, previous tracks we've we've heard for Three Worlds of Gulliver and Seventh Voyage, and Mysterious Island again, one of Ray's classic films from the era. Uh, the music is a key component for all of the creature sequences that are scattered throughout that film. And, and that film, which was again recorded in stereo, as I said before, that was made available on Cloud Nine Records as a stereo recording, and so you can hear stereo elements, and Connor's just played as there the stereo version of that. Um, up next, it's our final selection before we go to the interview we had with the Bernard Herman Society, and it's the, uh, the fourth and final collaboration, uh, Connor, isn't it, in 1963? Yes, Jason and the Argonauts was to be the final collaboration. What I found very interesting was that uh, initially, when Ray Harryhausen and Charles Schneer were, were, were planning the film, they, they had assumed that Herman may be unavailable, so they had planned to record the score with Mario Nassimbeni, who of course we discussed in our One Million Years BC retrospective. So he would eventually get to work with Ray and, and create a, a very interesting soundtrack, but of course, when, when they realised that Herman was available once more, they, they jumped at the opportunity to work with him for a fourth time. And the soundtrack, again, is, is quite different from from his first three collaborations with Ray. Um, there's not much in the way of a, a string section. This is lots of percussion, lots of brass. In my opinion, it delivers a very ancient feeling score. So this is the prelude for Jason and the Argonauts. <laughs> Me and other sort of uh, soundtrack purists, it sounds a bit like Alex North. So what Alex North was doing with Spartacus and, and, and that very sort of atonal music that was more reminiscent of um, a sort of uh, freewheeling percussion and, and brass, um, very effective. And it lasts today. It doesn't, it doesn't age the film. You know, the, the, the three, four scores that we talked about and listened to, I think almost have a, a timeless quality. But um, but next up, Connor, it's our big interview, isn't it? Who do we speak to this week? I think I've already given a, a, a spoiler there. But um, we had a big interview this week, didn't we? Yes, that's right. Our interview this week was with Gunther Kugeben from the Bernard Herrmann Society. Those of you who may not be aware of the Bernard Herrmann Society, they've got a very active online presence. You can check out their website at bernardherrmann.org where you'll find a raft of information about the composer and modern day concerts of his work and CD re-releases and, and other related news. And I was very interested because obviously there are parallels between the, the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation and a society such as the Bernard Herrmann Society. So I started off by asking Gunther how he came to be involved Involved with uh, such a, an institution and where his interest in Bernard Herrmann began. Basically, 
basically the, the uh, Bernard Herman Society started as the Bernard Herman web pages back in 1994. They were hosted by Kurt Gerde in Bergen at Bergen University, where, where the services are still hosted, by the way. A couple of months later, I joined up with, with Kurt and we started to do things. And then around the year 2000 or so, I had the idea to actually bit a bit, make it a bit more official. There, has been, there had been a Bernard Herrmann uh, Society in the 1980s, but that uh, went basically for a couple of years and then it vanished again. So, and I decided to, to approach uh, Bernard Herrmann's third wife, uh, Norma Herman, so who's living in the UK, by the way, and, and she um, thankfully agreed that we could become the official composer's society, and we have been since then. Yeah, and we try to put information out there which is not generally available uh, through our website and uh, do a few other things. We have a fan forum, the uh, Talking Herman, where, where, where it's quite lively, where they do discussions and all these kind of things. But also, of course, on Facebook. So in terms of his legacy and people talk of something being Herman-esque and so on, they're, they're thinking of the Orson Welles collaborations and the and the Hitchcock collaborations, which are, are very well documented and there's been lots of books written and so on. Uh, but interestingly, uh, the Harryhausen collaborations, which at the time may have been considered um, a, a, another role or another job, have actually um, showed us a surprising amount of longevity and have really stood the test of time and become some of his most... Uh, cherished, remembered, and and inspired works. You know, he's he, composers today, whether it's Giacchino or John Williams and so on. They often hark back to some of the early stuff with Ray Harryhausen as a as a good example of what to do for for action sequences. So it's it's sometimes, and I see even on the Wikipedia page for Bernard Herrmann, that there's not much for mention of those Harryhausen years and those those four and nearly five which we'll get on to, uh, Harry Hasen films. So Gunther, why do you think that is? Why, why is there a bit of a disconnect? That's an excellent question. I don't think there's been really that much research happened in that, uh, in that area. So everyone has done, well, Hitchcock to death, basically. So um, if people say Hermanesque, they usually mean, well, psycho, frankly. So, so all this psycho style, it's like, oh, this sounds like Herman. They only see that aspect of Herman. But... Um, where actually the, the Harryhausen films and some others, obviously, um, or The Day the Earth Stood Still, is also quite often, Danny Elfman and others have used that as a, well, blueprint for, for their film scores as well. So, but the Harryhausen is, is quite interesting. So if you see that, that within a week, Herman finished writing the score to Psycho, he started writing Three Worlds of Gulliver. It couldn't be more apart, both scores, if you think about it. So I don't quite know why nobody has actually done any research into this, really. So I think that there is a thesis coming on or two, I suppose. That is in- very interesting, and that's one of the notes that I made while I was uh, preparing for today's show, that Bernard Herrmann leaped from, from Psycho to the Three Worlds of Gulliver, and as you say, you can't imagine two more different soundtracks. And I listen to the soundtrack to Gulliver quite often, um, it's a, such a jolly and upbeat and uh, charming soundtrack and I think obviously the score to Psycho is one that everybody would know but to think that those two famous pieces of music were created back to back is just fascinating and it gives you some insight into the diverse uh, canon of music that Herman created throughout his life. Absolutely, so yeah, it's like, well, everybody mainly knows Psycho, Taxi Driver, so, which are also very different scores but also a bit dark in a way. Where Gulliver isn't, or uh, Trouble with Harry isn't either, so it's not a very dark score. So, so there, there is more than one Herman actually around. So that's, um, I think, probably part of the fascination with Herman that you, he had a bigger band with than people realize. So, he never did an outright comedy score or something like that. But I don't think Nicholas Roja did one. So. <laughs> So Gunther, he was in terms of his work was very varied, but as a, as a person and a personality, he's known as being, uh, you know, a difficult person, high maintenance. He might have been called these days. But his relationship with Ray Harryhausen and Charles Schnee, of course, survived four films. So um, and and of course he he'd come to Ray's house in West London, and Ray's daughter Vanessa told stories of when, you know, Bernie and 
Charles Schneer and Ray Harryhausen would get into heated discussions and sometimes her mum, Diana, would go in and calm things down. He was certainly a, a larger-than-life character. And how much do you recognise that? I mean, he'd, he would find it difficult working in today's environment with, uh, with, with so many snowflakes, as people call it now. You know, people are so sensitive, you can't put capital letter emails to people, you certainly can't raise your voice and so on. How would Mr Herman have fared today, do you think? I think he probably wouldn't go very far, I, I can imagine. So, so it would be probably a bit niche or... Well, basically, fans of his would hire him. So otherwise, I think he wouldn't fit in today's studio system in a way. Uh, but he never did, actually. So, so in a way, he had a bit of protection. And if, well, like, let be Orson Welles or Alfred Newman in the old days, or then later on had the, the, the connection with Truffaut or, or, or De Palma or, or even Martin Scorsese. So, so who really wanted him? I think that would probably have continued or so. so but I can't see. Seem really fitting in, so he would be. You know, he wasn't very diplomatic, so I remember someone saying, "Oh, he was completely bonkers." So there you go, brilliant mind. So what can we do? So it's so in terms of his recording process, the mechanical process of it. Um, do you at the Bernard Herman Society keep a track of original magnetic recordings? Is that done by the estate? Do you know if they even exist? Well. Well, Herman is quite quite a relatively good state of affairs. So, so most things exist in a form or another of the or, original recordings. Some things are well more or less lost, like Citizen Kane, or sadly the original uh, tapes to, um, of course, um, our Jason and the Argonauts. So that's all that was recorded at Shepparton, and this seems to now have been lost. Probably not later than the 1970s, which is a bit of a shame. So, um, when I remember David Wishart uh, telling me, so so David Wishart, who had a record label in the 70s, no, in the 80s and 90s, uh, Cloud Nine Records, they first put out um, uh, records on LP and later on CD. Um, so, and he did, of course, Three Worlds of Gulliver and Mysterious Island, and of course wanted to do Jazz and the Argonauts. But then he found out why his connect, uh, connections at uh, Sony Columbia, that like in the other scores, there were two boxes, one the music effects tracks and one with the music tracks. As, as he found out, the box that should have had the music tracks had also a second copy of the music and effects tracks in it. So that was a bit of shame. I know he tried again to find it, but so far to this day, nobody has found the original tapes to Jason and the Argonauts. Thankfully, a rarity. So Herman, I think, Recording-wise, is in a good shape. There are a few things missing, obviously, so who've never been found. They're probably um, over-recorded or uh, thrown away, especially in the magnetic tape area. So. Because originally he was recording in stereo. Seventh Voyage of Sinbad was a stereo recording. And- yeah, it was it would probably been three tra- three track, right, right, left, and center, basically, so which you could then mix down to either mono or stereo or whatever needs to be done. Yeah. Because obviously for the, for the mix and for the optical, for the theatres, it was always going to be a mono stem. Um, but we actually have some quarter inch um, mag track at the foundation in our vast sort of film and TV archive that we haven't transferred yet. So we're hoping that we might have some original session tapes. But you don't know if um, Bernard Herrmann kept tapes because Elmer Bernstein, I know, kept quarter inch tapes of everything he did. No, Herrmann wasn't that much tape keeping. He had a few tapes from the 70s as far as I know. So um, mainly mono mixed down tapes, but nothing that's actually missing in any form or other, I think so. The estate now has been, as far as I know, they have been quite successful in sourcing some tapes that were, well, never really missing, but never were really that found. So so they found found a few things like uh, the Companions and Nightmare and, and, and these things. So, But I'm um, not quite sure when that will be out or when it will be released. So, Sadly, mm, Jason is not amongst them. It is a shame. But you mentioned Cloud9 Records. I have all of their CDs. And uh, I think Connor has them in the foundation as well. And they did release a stereo version of Mysterious Island, which was, um, I think, from a, a four or five microphones placed. And it is, it's beautiful because there's a real depth to the stereo tracks. So... It's only a selection. It's only twelve tracks. It's not the entire score and all of the cues. But um, it, it, the hunt goes on. I mean, Connor is finding stuff all the time. Connor, aren't you? You're finding magnificent treasures in the in the Harryhausen archive. Yes, absolutely. Because Ray was very much somebody who would keep all of his uh, 
the, the various media that were involved with this film. So we've been finding uh, pieces of, of soundtracks and recordings and even letters, you know, letters to, to Charles Schneer and Bernard Herrmann and, and all, of, all of his contacts throughout the 1950s and 60s. And uh, what a treasure trove uh, we have. And it's, it's really important now because we can go back and when we hear about for instance, uh, budget disputes on a, on a film, we can go back and we can actually see the notes involved in, in the filmmaking process and the budget and the, the hard decisions sometimes that uh, that Mr. Charles Schneer had to make when, when producing Ray's films. And I know that that was part of the reason that uh, the Harryhausen and Herman collaboration stopped although it should be pointed out that it was a it was a professional relationship that ended but they remained friends after after were working together and for many years up until till Bernard Herrmann's death they they remained friendly I suppose they were both Americans uh, living in London and both I suppose quite strong individuals so despite the fact that on the surface their personalities were possibly quite different I think they were there were two people that maybe had a lot more in common than people might expect yeah I think so um um, basically, well, had always a bit of a love affair with England, in a way. So, so, and, and um, after the war, he came over in 1946 with his first wife to see basically Yorkshire and a few other parts of the country, and actually see where Wuthering Heights was actually supposed to have happened, and and these kind of things. And then he managed to conduct a few orchestras at the time. So, around 1946, so even the Holly uh, uh, Barbarolli's orchestra he conducted a couple of times. One or two of the BBC orchestras he did. And then um, he returned in 1955 to do The Man Who Knew Too Much. And then he um, basically, well, um, that was recorded in May 1955. And basically, the orchestra he had, the London Symphony Orchestra, the LSO, was basically a brand new orchestra because all the old players have, had left at the time in May uh, uh, 1955. And um, yeah, and then he had a basically a good relationship with the LSO at the time. So uh, for a couple of years, did a few concerts and they had all these new players like uh, Neville Mariner and, and uh, Jarvis Pazer and uh, God, um, Barry Tuckville and, and, and a few others. So, so uh, quite famous soloists later on in the life. So I think uh, the, the Herman made a quite a good impression on the young players at the time in the mid 50s. And he enjoyed it a, a lot. So, so and, and actually, he returned very often to London to conduct concerts until the, the early 60s. And by, in 1961, he bought actually a flat in, in, in near Regent's Park and uh, lived there for a couple of years. Uh, and then in 1964, he got divorced by his second wife and basically lived in that Regent's Park flat. So, and then basically became a Londoner at the time, so which falls quite nicely into to, when he recorded uh, Gulliver and um, uh, the Mysterious Island, which was also with the London Symphony Orchestra. I think he, Herman has hope to, to actually, I think, to, because it, the, the Alice O didn't have a chief conductor at the time, so that, that he actually probably go for that job, or if they asked him, so which they never did, and I think a couple of days after he finished uh, doing Mysterious Island, they, they asked uh, Pierre Monteux to be their chief conductor, so their first chief conductor in a long time at the time. So, um, and then Herman didn't use the LSO for 10 years. <laughs> side, side story. And for, for Jason, I think he used the RPO, correct me if I'm wrong, and I think he cr uh, used the RPO for that. For what should have been their fifth collaboration, First Men in the Moon, um, that had quite a good budget. So there's different stories as to why Bernard Herrmann didn't take part in that picture. <clears throat> One was that he had a falling out with Charles Schneer, as people often did. Um, Mikos Rocha famously did after Golden Voyage of Sinbad. Um, so um, interestingly, Laurie Johnson, who took over um, the scoring duties, tried to do something he said that emulated what he thought Bernard Herrmann would do. And in fact, the first few chords of First Men on the Moon sound like they could have been straight from Bernard Herrmann. So he, he definitely is channeling Bernard Herrmann during First Men in the Moon. Um, yeah, funny you say that, but uh, I think definitely you're right there. So they, they're very, very good friends, Laura Johnson and uh, Bernard Herrmann, so, so, which is also a bit surprising because I think they, 
their styles are not that similar, and they're totally different backgrounds musically wise. So, so but, but they seem to get get along brilliantly. So, I think, of course, Laurie Johnson at that time, nineteen sixty four five, I think would have been a lot cheaper than Bernard Homer was at the time. So, but never know. Uh, maybe the papers uh, Connor has access to will give give tell tell a tale of how much they offered, and. Um, don't forget, Herman also, he was asked to score Lawrence of Arabia back in 62, and uh, he wanted too much money, so, so they, they, they didn't take him. So uh, I think there was a bit, 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 bit of a... He probably was trying out his market value because as things go and what he got in, as a well, salary, if you can say so, um, uh, uh, money he got for, for scoring a film, he was, I think, but it, he wasn't top tier, he wasn't bottom tier, but he was in the middle of... Uh, uh, um, asking so, and then he probably tried to push the envelope a bit. So I think that's what happened. But yeah, sometimes when people um, are, are saying it's a money issue, it isn't often always a payment to themselves. In the case of Miklos Rocha for Golden Voyage, he was promised a, a very large orchestra. I think it was 110 piece, and it was a much much smaller um, set of players. I think it was 30 piece, so the budget wasn't there. So it, it, I wonder with um, Bernard Herman whether it was he wanted a certain amount of players and a certain orchestra. And, and maybe a conductor and so on to go with it. And and often if the budget isn't there, because in post-production, when you're doing the music, that's when, you know, you've you've chipped into it as part of your contingency from the shoot. So there's never money left in post. Composers always say this, you know, they never have enough time. There's never enough spotting sessions and so on. Um, I wonder if, if Connor, if you're able to, to um, throw any light on, on what the true story behind first Men in the Moon might have been between Laurie Johnson and Bernard Herrmann. Yeah, we should be able to to dig that out and have a look, um, because as I said, we do have we do have quite detailed notes, and there are a lot of uh, memos from Charles Schneider Turi, and uh, as you might expect, they're often very blunt and very to the point, and uh, they're always entertaining reading. So that is something that we'll definitely dig out from our archive and perhaps discuss in a future podcast when we when we cover First Men in the Moon. Um, I just want to go back to something you were talking about, Gunther, about uh, Herman's work in the late 1950s, because of course this is when he first uh, worked with Ray on The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, and that film is um, an absolute big bang moment, in, in my opinion, for, for fantasy cinema, for Ray Harryhausen personally, and uh, just for for special effects, uh, but of course Herman's music was one of the most important aspects of the film, and he himself described it as an atmosphere of mystical innocence, uh, which he tried to to apply to the film, and I can't think of a better description. When I introduced the, at the Science Museum in Oklahoma late last year, I thought that, I thought it was the perfect description from a film that people still cherish to this day, and it's a film that turns 60 years old this year. Um, I was just wondering if you had any specific thoughts on the, on the score to Seventh Voyage of Sinbad and what your memories and feelings about that music. Yeah, it was actually my first soundtrack CD I ever purchased was the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. Wow. Well, so uh, which was the or, or old Maurice edition, if if you think about it. So uh, that was done, I think, in the early early eighties. I bought it a bit later, I have to admit, but. Um, but this was actually the, the uh, first soundtrack city I bought. So it is a very, very nice score, I think. So it is, I don't think anything has been done like that before, in a way. So, so even if you, Rosa Steve of Park, that, or a few others that were a bit, bit before, but not to that extent. So, so I think it, he wrote a rule book to, to fantasy film scoring from that still thought, I suppose. So, so this is um, yeah a very important score I think so which is um, which we thankfully well have 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 the original tape so so that's been released and of course there's also a recording by John Dabney and the uh, Royal Scottish National Orchestra so so it is um, well served on CD I suppose so um, that speaks volumes I think and what about yourself Gunther do you do you have a favorite um, Harryhausen Herman collaboration score is it Seventh Voyage. Well, as the whole package is probably Seven Voyage. Uh, my favourite score, just listening, is I think Three Worlds of Gulliver. So because it's just so joyful and so different and so playful, and well, also harks back to composers who like to to eighteenth uh, century stuff and then all this kind of thing. So um, which which is a quite nice one. Uh, as film, I think my favourite film is of course Jason. So I think that's just just an amazing piece of. 
uh, film, especially when you see when it was made in the early 60s. So uh, that was actually about quite great uh, film and uh, probably has the best screenplay of the four. So. It is surprising to do something quite lyrical like Three Worlds of Gulliver that maybe other offers came in. Are you aware, you talked about Lawrence of Arabia, and I wasn't aware that he was he was asked to do that. Um, are you aware of other films that he'd, he'd, he'd turned down or was asked to do and was involved with? Oh, a uh, famous one is Lolita uh, Kubrick, so he turned that down uh, because he, they asked him to, to have a, a pre-existing melody. He turned down The Exorcist, I know that. And uh, and I think at one point he was also offered 2001 and then, uh, which probably quite, it was offered to, to uh, I think, Herman and Malcolm Arnold at the same time. And they, uh, they both actually uh, recommended uh, Cordell, who actually wrote a score, which is also not, not many people know. It was r- written and recorded, Cordell wrote a score for, for 2001. Was this before or after Alex North? Where did Alex North fit into that? Yeah, I think, and then, then after Cordell went, I think they, they got Alex North, and then, uh, of course, he, his, his score was also thrown out, so I think that's roughly how it went, uh, yeah. It is fascinating that very famous composers have scores, as you say, thrown out. It sounds so disrespectful, and we at the Foundation can hang our heads in shame and say that John Barry was asked to do a sample um, of music score for Clash of the Titans, and it was thrown out. So um, Connor found it, didn't you, Connor? Yes, just a couple of short months ago. We've been keeping it under our hat for the time being, but I suppose we'll let you in on a secret. Uh, a couple of months ago, I found a, a tape. Ray Harryhausen had a, a large tape collection. I was looking through these, and I found a tape, not specifically marked as a John Barry, but there were some song titles that, that struck a struck a chord. There was a song Andromeda and Scorpions, and I thought this could be something interesting. When I, when I opened it up and looked at the insert, it said John Barry 1980. So I had a listen, and that this was the, the lost score for Clash of the Titans. Just a short 15-minute demo track, but really wonderful. I'm really spine-tingling to hear that for the first time in 35 years, really being played. Wow, that's something. <laughs> John, John, John's heard it too. What were your impressions of it, John, when you, when you got a chance to listen? It was certainly John Barry. You know, when we think of what John Barry was doing in the late 70s, early 80s, he was doing some terrifically good scores for some fairly average films like the King Kong remake and the Black Hole and so on. And his music, you know, stands head and shoulders above the content of those films. And it was marvellous to hear an early 80s John Barry, and it was clearly John Barry. It gave me tingles. It's in stereo. The quality is pretty decent. And we hope in a future podcast to be able to release some extracts of that. Um, so, you know, Bernard Herrmann's in good company. He'd had, you know, John Barry's had things thrown out. But of course, Jerry Goldsmith has had lots and lots of scores thrown out over the years. He's quite prolific. Um, so, But Herrmann re- rejected more assignments than, than he got, uh, well, well, than he got a rejection. So uh, the, only, the only score Herrmann was actually rejected from was, of course, a, a very famous Tom Curtin band. So, but, but Herrmann, well, he himself, he, he declined lots of, uh, lots of um, other, other jobs, so, which he didn't want to do. So on the other hand, Herrmann, Herrmann did also some strange films like It's Alive, because I think because he, he liked Larry Cohen so much, but otherwise I can't really explain it. But you never know. But those films have lasted. You know, It's Alive at the time was seen as kind of trashy B-movies. But of course, the scores and the films themselves, which have been remastered in Blu-ray and getting a re-release this year, um, have have proved to be, you know, more robust than A pictures at the time, starring the big marquee names of the time. And and we found that with Ray's films, you know, he he wasn't given the advertising and PR push from the studios because it was always a big... William Holden film or something with Burt Lancaster in it and a lot of those films haven't even been scanned in 2k whereas Ray's films have all been scanned in 4k fully restored stereo sound interesting absolutely so and if if you really think about it none of her well hardly any of Herman's film scores or films he did were absolutely the actually big studio projects so even Things like Vertigo or North by Northwest, where you think, okay, that might be closest he ever got to to being A-list or A-list material. So what they think was A-list, let's say that. Way. So, uh, but, but Hitchcock mainly was an independent producer. So it wasn't really, he never really had a big uh, studio uh, outfit. I think the only thing he ever 
did that was probably torn curtain and then he uh, got fired from that so because of the pressures from from universal so uh, well actually hitchcock himself well let's let's blame let's blame who's to blame which would have been hitchcock so frankly so he did the buck stops with him and nobody else i think on that so um so it is quite interesting to see but even things like taxi driver which are now absolutely regarded as classics or citizen kane were actually that big films when they were out so citizen kane was a flop so vertigo was a flop basically so which is actually quite quite strange how this actually worked out in the end so so i think herman's tastes in film so the assignments he chose especially when he was able to choose that uh, showed him that he actually saw the qu- some quality in them. Well, we have various talks, lectures and exhibitions that we regularly do here at the Foundation. And of course, as part of that, we want to make music and sound and the oral histories we have with Ray Harryhausen and a bigger part of our public access programme. So I do hope in, in the future, Gunther, we can kind of, we can call on you and maybe we can swap resources because if we find uh, Bernard Herman items and artefacts, we'd be happy to sort of share information with you, wouldn't we, Connor? Yes, of course. And bef- before we wrap up, I do want to uh, I want to discuss a, a tantalising lost treasure, a, an unrealised project that Bernard Herrmann and Ray Harryhausen discussed together, possibly during those visits to, to Ray's home that you spoke about, John. Um, in an interview for Mike Hankin's wonderful Master of the Magics books, Ray speaks about a, a plan that they had to create a kind of Fantasia-style film project where... Herman would write the music first, give it to Ray, and Ray would animate uh, according to the music. So rather rather than the other way around with uh, Herman animating to to a finished film, the music would be created first, and then Ray would see see where the imagination of this took him and and create models and and create animation for this. Now, I think they they quickly realised that this probably wouldn't have passed uh, the budget of of Mr Charles Schneer and and everybody else, so logistically it was possibly a bit unrealistic. But it's nice to think of these two geniuses from different fields letting their imaginations run wild and and talking about what they would have done in a perfect world if, if money and time was no object. Oh, yeah, it sounds fascinating. So, yeah, well, they might have done a short, so that would have been, probably worked. So if they had, did a three or four minute piece but, as a demo, but well, yes. that would have been nice. Well, I know that Ray was also, um, as, as he mentions in, in John's documentary, he was keen on doing a, a stop motion version of Dante's Inferno. So it's a similar thing. I mean, it's a, it's a, a passion project, but... Uh, whether he could convince uh, film studios that an audience would would sit and watch this is a is a different matter. But yeah, as this uh, so uh, Herman was quite lucky that he had well, people like Harryhausen, Schneer, um, Hitchcock, and and um, Scorsese, uh, Wells, and De Palma, and Fra- well, basically, basically he chose these projects quite well, so they kept him basically in in our minds still today. I think so um, that he did ease. So I. I I don't think if he just had been unlucky and did, did a few Fox films, it, it would be forgotten now, like a Blue Denim and, and, and these kind of films that nobody remembers. So I think we would have uh, would have been a, a different uh, story these days. So, so um, it also comes down a bit to 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 how all the films are, are um, well work poster. Uh, uh, well, and posterity. So it's been marvelous catching up with you today, Gunther. Thank you for taking the time. Yes, the, the, the Herman and Harry Housen collaborations have been ones that have stood the test of time, as you say, Gunther, and it's that, that collaborative streak which has led to both names being remembered so well. So thank you very much, and I would advise everybody who has enjoyed this podcast to head along to your website. It, it's bernardherman.org, and you can also be found on, on Facebook where you have a, a lot of content for people to enjoy. Well, thank you very much, Gunther, and thank you very much, John. It's been a, a very interesting conversation. It's fascinating, and of course, it's 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 very interesting to see which which films um, Bernard Herrmann was offered and he and he turned down, and and the whole idea of composers having scores thrown out when they've been fully recorded. So it is a, it is a fascinating and rather brutal world, and the fact that. A disposable world as well. Original master tapes for Jason the Argonaut, which were recorded in stereo, are um, missing, presumed lost. So, you know, we're hopeful, as as we talked about in that extract, we're, we're looking through cassettes and, and magnetic tape we have in the foundation. But um, it was fascinating. We could have sp- spoken all day, Connor, couldn't we? 
That's right. He had so many um, interesting personal recollections, and I think it was very interesting to note that his first Herman soundtrack, the first CD or or the first album which he ever bought, was the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, and and look at what that's gone on to affect his life. He's now. Uh, director of the the Bernard Herman Society and involved every day. But I also, I mean, for for me, uh, what I find personally most interesting is the relationships which Ray maintained with such legendary figures uh, throughout his career. And even though their even though their professional relationship came to a halt, uh, their personal relationship continued, and they they remained friends up until the end of of Herman's life. Given that he had a reputation for being a very difficult man, I think it's a testament to Ray Harryhausen that Bernard Herman continued to to be his friend and visit him in his London home. I think, yes, you know, to to give um, credit to Bernard Herman, he had little patience for fools. And for those people who listen and know much about Ray Harryhausen, Ray was a very precise individual who could make specific plans for very complicated films and and talk about them in advance. And so for somebody like Bernard Herrmann, who wants that sure-footedness, then certainly working with Charles and, and Ray Harryhausen, um, he, he would have got that, and he certainly received that. And, you know, I think that there is something to be said for the Harryhausen-Herrmann collaborations in the same breath as Herman and Orson Welles and Herman and Hitchcock. So um, let's hope we can have some updates to their Wikipedia page so that it actually gives... Um, you know, more balance, more balance to that relationship of, of four films. And as we move forward to next episodes, Connor, we can talk about the other films, including First Men in the Moon, where Bernard Herrmann was planning to do the score, but didn't. And as, as we teased up there in that interview, there were discussions with Laurie Johnson, who then took over. Um, but what have we got next? Have we got any other business, uh, Connor, to discuss? 2018 is going to be a busy year for the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation because, of course, there are very notable anniversaries for some of Ray's films this year. So, the film we've spoken about previously today, The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, turns 60 years old. Um, Similarly, Jason and the Argonauts will be 55 years old and The Golden Voyage of Sinbad will be a relatively young 45 years anniversary this year. So three of Ray's most beloved films and of course we'll be recording podcasts for all three we recorded an extended 90 minute long podcast for Clash of the Titans back in 2016 to celebrate its 35th anniversary and I'd say that's probably one of our most popular episodes and one that we're, we're very proud of and we'll be recording extended podcast retrospectives for each of those films throughout the year so it's definitely something to keep an eye on and something I'm very much looking forward to. We will scour the archive and look for some interesting anecdotes and interesting material that we can add for each of those films. But John you've uh, turned your hand to a little bit of of writing as well haven't you because more immediately we have an article featured in Infinity Magazine which comes out this week on Thursday the 15th of February. That's right. Infinity Magazine, which is part of Hemlock Books, uh, publishes lots of great science fiction and and retro style um, movie articles. And so Infinity Magazine is relatively young. It's up to um, issue eight now, as I'm counting on my fingers. And we've written an article there at the foundation. I've penned it and it's called Ray Harryhausen, The Golden Voyages Continue. So it's a look back at some of uh, Ray's films and work, but also a little insight into what's coming up next. So if you think you know everything about Ray Harryhausen, then you don't. Please buy the magazine and take a look. And it's got some exclusive photography in there as well, uh, provided uh, through the foundation from Simon Harvey, a professional photographer, and Andy Johnson as well, a great friend of the foundation. And it's a great magazine, you know, outside of the article we've been involved with it's certainly one to uh, to support so support british publishers and uh, and magazine owners so please uh, take a look at that yeah i think a lot of our listeners will be aware of dark side magazine which is the horror movie magazine from the same publishers and infinity is their latest um, enterprise it's a kind of science fiction sister magazine to dark side so if anybody's read dark side magazine you'll know how high quality the writing is and uh, you should definitely check out this issue number eight because it's, it's going to be a cracking read. So you can find Infinity Magazine and the other titles such as Dark Side at hemlockbooks.co.uk and that's hemlock spelled H-E-M 
L O C K. And uh, yes, one to uh, to add to the pile to read. Now, speaking of Golden Voyages, uh, we have a special screening coming up for the Golden Voyage of Sinbad at the Regent Street Cinema in London. And you're going to be doing something special there, John, alongside trustees Vanessa Harryhausen and star of the film, Caroline Monroe. Yes, so on Sunday, February the 25th at 3pm, as Connor said, at the Regent Street Cinema, we're going to be having a special 4K projection of the Golden Voyage of Sinbad, digitally restored and with stereo sound for the very first time. And we're going to be doing a presentation, so you'll be able to see some some close-up, high-quality photography of some of the collection and some sketches and so on. And there's going to be a chance to have a, a Q&A session with Vanessa Harryhausen and Caroline Monroe straight after the film. I don't think there are many tickets left, so at this stage I would suggest if you go online to the Regent Street Cinema, if you just Google that and uh, find it on their events page. But it's a wonderful way to spend a Sunday afternoon and it's it's marvellous to see the film back on its 45th birthday, looking uh, all shiny and new. And in fact, better than when it was first shown in 1973 with stereo sound for the first time. So, very exciting. Yes, that's going to be a wonderful afternoon. Speaking of events in London as well, we have an exhibition to announce. And this will be taking place in Dagenham. Now, the reason for that is because this exhibition, which is called Dinosaurs, Harryhausen and Me will be a special look at the work of our official conservator and good friend Alan Friswell. The exhibition will be looking at his career in model making and in restoration. And so, of course, we were happy to lend some of the models that he's repaired for us over the years and some of the models that he worked with alongside Ray will be on display. So that's at the Valence House Museum in Dagenham. Just a hair's breadth from, from London. You can you can jump on the tube or jump on the train and get out there. And uh, from the 9th of March. And it's going to be really interesting to explore Alan's work and celebrate his contribution because his work is wonderful. We've had him on the podcast before, of course. And we, we, all, we regularly display his incredible restorations on our Facebook and Twitter page. And so it's going to be very worthwhile for people to explore some of his incredible creations in the flesh. Absolutely. So um, I think one of the final bits of news we've got is about the uh, the Ray Harryhausen poster book, which um, is now available to pre-order via Amazon. It's um, out, I think, on the 4th of September this year. So those of you who've been involved with us in the book, there's a, a bit of update news to tell your friends. And those of you who want to pre-order it now, I think you can go on the site and, uh, and take a look. That's right. It's ready for pre-order. And everybody who contributed and who's images were, were used in the book, I have to offer a massive thank you because we were inundated. Uh, when we announced the poster book this time last year on our podcast, uh, the next day the inbox was full of people offering their their posters or, or lists of their collections and it was fascinating to look through them all and I know that Richard Hollis, the author of the book, was delighted by some of the contribution from race fans worldwide. Yes, he was. So um, we're looking forward to... Um, that book coming out and hopefully having uh, some events as well with the book. We'll have more news on that, won't we, Connor, near the time? Yes, just uh, stay posted. Keep an eye on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Ray Harryhausen, or our Twitter page, which is twitter.com slash Ray underscore Harryhausen. And of course, our official website, which is rayharryhausen.com. And of course, future editions of the podcast. Now, before we go, as we always try and do in this podcast, bring you something unique and special. And here's an audio clip from Ray Harryhausen. That's right, John. We're going to hear a clip from the commentary that you recorded with Ray for Mysterious Island. And in this clip, Ray's talking about Bernard Herrmann's score for the Fohorokis sequence. Uh, this clip, I think, reveals a little bit about Ray's relationship with Bernard Herrmann and the, the good times, the good humor that the, the two shared. Music makes so much difference in a thing like this because there's a minimum of dialogue. Oh, he said, he said when we first ran it together uh, with Charles, he said, I'm going to put Turkey in the Straw, the music for Turkey in the Straw. He did a good score for it.
Copyright in the Ray Harryhausen podcast is owned by the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation, a registered Scottish charity, number SC001419, 2018. This recording may not be reproduced in whole or in part without written permission from the Foundation. The views expressed within these podcasts do not necessarily reflect those of the Foundation, its trustees or employees. For further terms and conditions, please contact us at rayharryhausen.com, where you can also find our Facebook and Twitter links.